Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the webinar, You Never See Our Best Work, OCWD's Seawater Intrusion Barrier. My name is Crystal Nettles and I'm with the Orange County Water District. Today's webinar is the fifth in a series of monthly webinars aimed at highlighting some of the programs and projects of OCWD and our program partners. We are so excited that you are joining us today. Today's webinar will last one hour. And prior to getting started with today's program, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items, learn a little bit about the audience and introduce our program speakers. As a webinar attendee, you are muted. This is to reduce background noise. Should you have a question for our speaker, please type your question into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. You may also use the raised hand feature. To keep the webinar moving, speakers will wait until the end of the presentation to answer questions. Written questions will be answered first, followed by those raising their hand. In the event we run out of time and do not get to your question, or if you have any follow-up questions, please email info at ocwd.com. Finally, this webinar is being recorded. You will receive a link to the recording tomorrow via email. We have a large group of people joining us today and we'd love to learn more about you so our speakers can better tailor their presentations. First up, please choose the option that best describes where you live. And we'll give people about 10 more seconds to answer. All right, so the vast majority are actually outside Orange County, followed by within Orange County, with the majority living inland. Next up, please tell us your familiarity with the topic of seawater intrusion. We'll give people a few more seconds to answer. All right, so the vast majority are somewhat familiar and knowledgeable um, with some very familiar and knowledgeable. So this will help us tailor our presentation as well. So thank you guys so much for that. With that, I would like to bring in our speakers and have them introduce themselves. Um, we will start with John Bonsenyu. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, hi, my name is John Bonsenyu. I am a geologist on staff at the Orange County Water District. Uh, I've, I've been at the district for 20 years uh, working on the Talbert Seawater Intrusion Barrier, all 20 of those years. And um, I have the great pleasure of working with some wonderful people at the Orange County Water District, one of which is uh, my partner, Justin McKeever. Thank you, John, and good morning. Good morning. This is uh, this injection uh, procedure was started in the oh, about 1999 with the district. But my background is I'm a water well driller by trade, so you can say that I've spent half my career taking it out, and this next half of my career I'm learning how to put it back in. But I need to take this chance to uh, make sure that I include my staff, uh, and they include Scott Davidson, Mr. Randy English, and Wesley Haydock. They are the, uh, the background that uh, you don't see them very well. They're, uh, they're chugging along today. So I'm going to move this over to Mark and uh, let Mark introduce himself. Hi everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Vukojevic and I'm the department director for our utilities department here at the city of Newport Beach and uh, water, uh, wastewater, and then we also have a very unique drainage and tidal drainage system that uh, this department is responsible for. So, and I'm also a registered civil engineer and look forward to sharing with you uh, some of the things about Newport. Thank you. Thank you all very much for joining us. 
We are going to begin today's presentation uh, with John Bonsangu and Justin McKeever. So take it away. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Crystal. Um, so thank you for joining in and, and your interest in this project, uh, folks. We really appreciate that. It sounds like a lot of you know uh, are very familiar with seawater intrusion, so this should be a good review. Uh, there's going to be some historical background that we're going to go into. We're going to talk a little bit briefly about the geology, why we need a seawater barrier to begin with, and then we're going to talk uh, in some detail about the wells themselves and how those work. So if you'll uh, bear with me here, we'll move to the next slide, please. So the Orange County Groundwater Basin is uh, 350 square miles. Uh, it does not encompass the entire county. Uh, the map shows the boundaries of the county in uh, yellow there, and the uh, groundwater basin is in black. So the uh, groundwater basin supplies 77% uh, <coughs> uh, of the demand for uh, of wa water demand for up to 2.5 million people in the north and central part of Orange County. Um, and um, the groundwater basin uh, supplies uh, about 350 acre feet per year to these people. So as we move through this presentation, um, I'd like to introduce this concept of acre feet really quick. It's a, a quantity of water. It's 325,900 gallons. That doesn't mean a lot. It's essentially an acre of land, uh, think football field, flooded one foot deep of water. So that's kind of how we in the water business uh, uh, keep track of these large volumes of water. So just keep in mind as we go through this, acre feet is uh, one acre of land uh, flooded uh, one foot deep in water. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, great. So here's the groundwater basin now at depth, and it's it's estimated that the groundwater basin uh, holds 60 million acre feet of fresh water, and um, the groundwater basin uh, the the water is, resides in the basin in aquifers, and aquifers in our basin are uh, comprised of sands and silt materials. And uh, as you see on the right, you can see the water resides in those tiny little grain to grain contact, uh, throat openings between the grain to grain contact. There's a lot of these uh, 60 million uh, acre feet <coughs> worth of water here. One thing I wanna point out real closely are the arrows in this cross-sectional view. So you're looking at depth into the earth about 2,500 feet. You see the aquifers in light blue. You can see the uh, non-aquifer materials in a tan color and I like to you did notice the red arrows showing the direction that the groundwater is moving in the aquifers and it's primarily moving from Anaheim to the Pacific or from right to left. But look at the left there around the Pacific. You're going to see our injection wells and you're going to see some orange arrows moving from the ocean into the interior of the basin. So that's the barrier and that's what we're going to focus on. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, great. So um, the Orange County Groundwater Basin, we mentioned supplies 77% uh, of the water demand for North Orange County, and it does it through uh, 200 large scale uh, production wells that are removing uh, groundwater uh, out of the aquifer, out of the groundwater basin. And um, next slide, please. The red dots there show uh, the location of these 200 wells. And as all these 200 wells are pumping, uh, you can imagine that there's some problems. And uh, you can see these red arrows here that are uh, showing uh, how ground, uh, ocean water can seep into the groundwater basin. And they do it through these um, interesting gaps uh, that are identified by these red arrows. So these are low lying topographic features in between mesas. Uh, and um, the geology is such that uh, there's a connection to the ocean. And we're gonna explore that connection in this presentation as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, great, thank you. 
Uh, so the Orange County coast is, is really characterized the geology by the uh, main fault system called the Newport Inglewood Fault. Uh, there was some uplift in this area along the coast. And um, like I mentioned, the aquifers, they were formed out in these carved out gap areas. Now you can see the blue arrows indicating them. And there's the Talbert Gap. And that's where the Talbert Barrier is at the bottom of your screen. And that's where we're going to concentrate most of our efforts uh, today. Uh, but then there's the Bolsa Gap, Sunset Gap, and the Alamitos Gap. The Alamitos Gap does have a seawater intrusion barrier also. Um, next slide, please. Okay, great. Now we're going to, um, so that's a little bit of the background on the geology. We're going to talk a little bit of the history about now how the uh, Talbert Barrier came to be. And uh, as I get into this, I would like to uh, mention, we have an engineer, uh, principal engineer on staff at the Orange County Water District who couldn't join us today, uh, but this is his hard work. He did all this historical background stuff and his name is Tim Sovich. So I just wanted to acknowledge him. He put these historical slides together. So in the, 19, or in the 1890s to the early 1900s, uh, this area of uh, Huntington Beach, uh, that, that Talbert Gap area was originally swampy. Uh, Fountain Valley got its name because uh, water, fresh water was coming right up out of the ground, uh, artesian style. And um, by uh, 1910, they had to construct these drainage dish ditches to drain the land. That was the big problem. And one of the uh, prominent farmers in the area, Tom Talbot, wrote a book called My 60 Years in California. And he described this uh, condition. And uh, Justin, I think you read the book, didn't you? Behind me, John, on the bookshelf, John. Oh, it's, there you uh, go. Very it's, good. it's classic, and it, yeah. it it was called Gospel Swamp prior to Fountain Valley. So it was water everywhere, uh, and that was a good thing. Uh, next slide, please, um, because we're talking about the Roaring Twenties, which was the uh, the the um, agricultural revolution, and in, in Orange County, that meant a lot of pumping of. Uh, aquifers and the shallow most aquifer that was pumped for the for agricultural purposes was the Talbert aquifer so we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, but by the mid 1920s that the water levels uh, had dropped below sea level in the Talbert aquifer so no longer was there free flowing water to the surface and with that seawater intrusion began into the groundwater basin for Orange County incidentally uh, oil was also discovered in the area uh, next slide, please. So we're kind of moving out of the uh, agri agricultural revolution and now into the industrial revolution. This is actually what the area looked like uh, in 1928. And there, boy, there are a lot of oil wells uh, first discovered in 1920, very prolific by 1928. And there were some oil brines that were associated with this operation that were discharged right onto the surface of the land. And it's speculated that these brines were able to seep down into the aquifer. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So by the 1930s and 40s, um, increases in pumping called, caused seawater to move in over a mile inland. And uh, the city of Newport Beach and Laguna Beach have some wells located uh, along the coast, uh, where you see that pink oval right now in the photograph. And uh, yeah, those, those wells had to be abandoned because they were pumping salty. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So here's an aerial map of that Talbert Gap area. Um, and uh, during the 19th, and, 50s and the 60s, the Geologic Survey, Department of Water Resources for California and OCWD set out to define the extent of the seawater intrusion. So you can see the uh, 30, uh, sorry, 50 milligram per liter uh, chloride contour line in green down there at the bottom in 1931. And uh, boy, by 1944, it had moved beyond those Newport wells. You could see it in the purple line. And that's what took out the Newport Wells there. And you can see it just progressively got 
uh, further and further inland until 1963, where it, it crosses over Ellis Avenue. Ellis Avenue is uh, peppered right there with the uh, green squares, and those green squares represent the injection wells for the Talbert barrier. Next slide, please. Uh, so here we go again. Uh, by 1963, the chloride front had migrated past Ellis Avenue uh, and the salinity concentrations really creeped up there. So uh, yeah, the district was forced to address the issue for sure. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the <laughs> state recommended two seawater barriers, uh, we, the one up north for Alameda, and the one for uh, Fountain Valley uh, in the Talbert Gap. And it was recommended by the state that for the Talbert barrier that we look at using recycled water because we don't have a whole lot of uh, fresh available water anymore in Orange County. Yeah, the, uh, district, the, the, the district drilled three injection wells right near the campus of Orange County Water District. And they started experimenting in 1967. Um, and that was a, a joint effort with the government and the district and, and, the, and the formation of the early water factory 21. So in 1967, we had three injection wells. And those three injection wells are still in use today, correct? Absolutely. All right, outstanding. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to take another cross-sectional look uh, at depth going down about 600 feet right in that Talbert Gap area. So this is how the uh, pathway for seawater intrusion is set up. So you can see our aquifer, the main at the bottom, lambda alpha, uh, lambda beta alpha Talbert. Um, and uh, you can see the Newport Inglewood fault there. It does a great job of truncating the main aquifer from the Pacific Ocean. But when you look at those red ovals, you can see there's our connection point into the Talbert aquifer. And then you can see to the, that the Talbert aquifer is clearly in contact with the Pacific Ocean. So you can see the preferential pathway now. Ellis Avenue is projected uh, on, at the top on ground surface of that uh, cross section. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, historically, intrusion was primarily limited to the Talbert and the Alpha aquifers, uh, but uh, due primarily to the agricultural pumping. But as the uh, populations grew, the wells got deeper, and um, uh, they started uh, pulling from deeper aquifers. Uh, next slide, please. OK, very good. So this brings us uh, up to about uh, the time of Water Factory 21. So uh, this would be 1975 timeframe uh, where you could see now the barrier has been built out. There's a, a number of uh, injection wells in the middle of the diagram here. To the right is where the production wells are. So in between the ocean and the production wells now, we have this alignment of injection wells, injecting fresh recycled water from Water Factory 21, which is the predecessor to today's modern GWRS treatment facility. Uh, you can see with all the injection that we do, uh, we've been able to kind of hold the, the salt water front there from uh, diving down too deep. It is in the lambda, and you can see where we'd like to hold it, that desired holding point. So that's, that's the, the um, challenge is to keep it close to that uh, desired holding point. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Ah, very good. So here we have today the modern setup. So GWRS is, is, is shown uh, up there on the ground surface. Oh, can we go back uh, one, one second, please? Uh, just wanted to point out something <coughs> real quick, if I could. Thank you. 
there's this one monitor well right here in this emergence zone, this critical emergence zone with the Lambda aquifer and the, uh, and the Talbert aquifer and the Pacific Ocean. It's called monitor well M26. And we, we closely, like uh, real time daily, monitor the level in that well. I hear right John. I can look at it on my phone. And at six o'clock this morning, we were 3.68 feet above sea level. So this is, uh, this is technology in today's world where you can physically look and monitor. And we gauge the barrier's performance on M26. Excellent, yeah. So um, this is how we monitor the performance, the overall performance of the, of the Talbert barrier. And this is how we know we're providing a uh, protective elevation of fresh water so that the uh, producers can pump all they need to further inland. So next slide, please. And, and what we're gonna move into now, folks, is uh, with the next slide is uh, we're gonna discuss the wells themselves and how they perform. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda uh, let Justin lead this part of the conversation, if that's all right. Next one. Well, the layout, as you can see, all the green wells were, were what we term the legacy. I don't know how that happened, but it happened. So I wells one through 23 are all along Ellis Avenue and they're approximately 600 feet apart. And then the, the monitoring well that you just saw is down around Adams and Bouchard. So we have all these injection wells. I think today we're currently injecting 28 million. Now these ovals popped up, these are the other wells that were built as, as we grew. This is 26 and we call these the modern wells. We have a few down south on the Southeast barrier. Then we have 27 and 28 in Harper Park. Then we have the remaining up near Beach Boulevard, 29 through 32. So this is, this is how we, we inject the water and we gauge everything from M26. Next slide, please. So the, the legacy wells drilled in 1975 are almost identical to the same wells that are over near Seal Beach on the other barrier, the Alamitos barrier. So the construction techniques were one borehole and several nested six inch stainless steel casings. And then there were these five to 10 foot layers of concrete between them. Well, as, as, as you drill the well and install it, it's all done with reverse circulation, which I was familiar with in my younger years. These are all louvered casings. Now, currently these are all operating on injection and we use a pressure reducing valve to maintain downstream pressure in the casing, which is fairly low, less than five PSI. And, and we attempt to put water in all four casings if they're still alive. And one of the wells that were drilled in 1967 can still produce 900 gallons a minute. So they're very effective. These are all in vaults, difficult to work on, and they're fully automated. Next slide, please. The newer wells, uh, <clears throat> which we've coined modern well design. They're all 12 inch stainless steel casing. There's 22 inch borehole, also drilled reverse. And John and I, we're, we're kind of wire wrap people. So they're, they're stainless steel and everything down hole is stainless steel. The flow control valves are fully automated and we can talk to these with our PCS terminal at the district. Each one has a, each one could do more than uh, 695 gallons a minute, but we hold them at about 1 million gallon per day. So like I said, uh, currently today, I think our set point is right around 28 MG. 
but you'll see there's some details down in here. We use some fancy uh, oil field uh, concrete to improve our, we don't want any vertical travel. And that's about that one. So you can see that was 2003. Okay, this next slide shows how we can put three injection wells on 15 foot centers. And that's I-26 on the left. Now, as we grew, we started to learn that we needed wells in various places. So the one on the right is a single point well. So it's a standalone. These are about a thousand feet apart and they're over on the Southeast barrier. Next slide. The legacy wells, they are a challenge for us. As you can see, we usually have to take out a full lane of traffic. So whenever you're driving down Ellis and you see a lane closed and you see the pump rigs working, we hire contractors to come in and assist us for the, for the uh, rehab. And we try to do this sometimes about every two years. The, uh, the uh, slide on the left is being airlifted with our portable compressor that the staff uses. Next slide. You can see that particles get caught between these sand grains. So what we do is we use massive amounts of air and we reverse the flow and we want the sand grains to be non-clogging. So we reverse the flow somewhere around every 40 million gallons of injection. We try to reverse its flow and we airlift it um, to uh, gain the performance back. Next slide. This is a good slide here. And if you're an operator of injection wells, you'll see that there's things that affect it. The water we're currently using has no food source. It is RO water. But what we have is that solid blue line and it's suspended solids that clog. And that blue line is signifying the level. The, uh, the gas bubble is sometimes you see people attempting to just inject water into the casing and air gets caught or air bound. The abundant food supply is sometimes a quality of water that has a food source in it and you get biofouling. But our wells at the district is kind of like that solid blue line. Next slide. We watch the water quality very closely. John and I have come up with several ways to, to look at things over the last 20 years together. We look at turbidity very closely. We also do SDI and uh, MFI. Um, we also use a particle counter at the final product water on the campus. And we have several laser turbidimeters that we can move about. Currently, we're setting one up at IWELL 32. Then we have this bypass filter where we send water through a five and a one micron filter through a length of time and volume. We dry them and weigh them and we watch the uh, particles uh, as they get injected, we kind of mimic it with the filters. Next slide. A little close up of the, uh, of the bypass filter. This is a really unique tool and if anybody's doing any injection, I, I strongly uh, suggest using it. It's uh, pretty straightforward. And uh, if you have any questions about having set one of these up. I always share information with anybody who's asking. Go to the next one. This is a cartoon drawing of what these wells look like. Uh, the one on the left, you can see that the uh, camera tube is attached to the well casing. And 
we use that camera tube to blow air down the camera tube, thus making the air travel up the 12 inch casing. Well, then we're pulling a vacuum on the screen. So by injecting large amounts of air through the camera tube, we can allow the casing to run backwards in our respect, since 99% of the time they're injecting water into that screen. One on the right, if we don't have enough submergence, and I'm not gonna get in the weeds about submergence, but we've installed dedicated airlines in the shallower wells that need proper submergence, and we blow air through that dark shaded tube, and the airline is looking up, which draws a vacuum on the well casing, drawing water in and reversing its flow. Next slide. So here we are, the one on the left is, is what you never see, but during construction, you can see that we have uh, several tubes surrounding the 12 inch casing. The one on the far left is that discharge line. The, uh, the odd looking shape is, uh, is the camera port. And that allows us to get various tools in and out of the well casing without pulling anything out of the well. The uh, other tube to the right um, is our gravel feed tube. And this is really important to keep an eye on. We, uh, we, we, we use about oh, 10 to 20 feet of gravel above the screens. We don't like to use too much. But as you can see, all stainless construction. This is our in-house airlifting um, that we do. Um, we can move this about, about every 30 to 40 million gallons and it's portable and it's, uh, it, it produces instrument quality air. Next slide, I think we've got a video coming up. Yeah, here's a quick video. This was a five minute video and we chopped it up to like one, in, one, uh, one minute. You can see we're using a large diameter air hose. This is iWell 29. We bring out some fittings and we inject air into our camera tube. My buddy Scott, we're sending a, about 400 to 500 cubic feet a minute. He's starting to throttle, opening the air. We're sending it down the camera tube. The pressure gauge is coming up. We know exactly where this is gonna break over because it takes 2.31 feet per one pound, we can work ourselves backwards and tell exactly where we're airlift pumping by using our instruments. The triple well, that's I-29, give a little show for you. We normally don't like to put too much water out on the, on the, on the ground, but uh, it's always fun. This design incorporates this camera tube, this camera tube is installed when we're building the well casing so that later on down the line, uh, we, can, we don't have to use dedicated pumps, although we have several wells that have electric submersibles. We find the airlifting technique very valuable for the district. And the slide in the center is I-26 kilo, that's airlifting. And then the casing, the image on the right is there again, what you never see once all the concrete's in place, but there's some uh, pretty fancy welding that takes place. Next slide. Johnny B. Mm. Oh, okay. I think my slides are populating a little slower than yours. I, okay, I think great. so too, John. Yeah. Um, so let's just bring this all together. We have this slide here. Thank you very much, Justin. You did a great job uh, running us through the well. And, uh, and this is just a, a cross section again, uh, just showing, uh, you can see the arrows, all the water leaving the injection alignment along Talbert. And just so you know, there's about 102 of these individual injection well casing. And they range in depth from anywhere to 100 feet to as deep as like 700 feet. Uh, and so they're continuously moving water out 
uh, 24 seven, 365, allowing the production wells to produce inland and holding that desired, uh, holding the seawater near that desired uh, point and definitely keeping us above sea level in our very important monitoring well number M26. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, great. So uh, <clears throat> in conclusion, looking at the historical stuff, the Talbert Aquifer dropped below sea level in the 1920s, right around the time oil was discovered. Um, the sailing front uh, from the ocean had migrated uh, inland to Ellis Avenue in the, by 1965, and the, and the state was uh, looking for ways to control this. Uh, the Talbert Barrier was constructed uh, and uh, operational in 1976. Those were the original 23 wells that Justin was referring to as the legacy wells. But as the populations grew, uh, the barrier needed to be expanded. Uh, Orange County Water District's groundwater replenishment system uh, was, was built uh, and it provides the means to expand that barrier. And uh, to, so we could maximize and meet the current water demand for the Orange County groundwater basin. And then finally, uh, we're expanding that treatment facility right now. And uh, when the expansion is completed, we will have surplus water available for future need uh, to address any kind of uh, seawater intrusion vulnerability that, that may lie in the future for, for our groundwater basin. So at this point, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, tuning in to the Talbot Barrier portion of the program. And I'm gonna um, turn this back over to our host for the next portion of our program. Thank you so much, John and Justin. And I apologize for any delay that you guys were experiencing um, in advance, advancing the slides and any um, delay our audience um, was experiencing. At this point, I would like to turn it over to Mark Vukojevich from Newport Beach. Great, thanks everyone. Um, so the reason why I'm here is to give you a little bit of a perspective from a groundwater user or groundwater pumper. And uh, we'll go to the next slide. And I wanna talk a little bit about Newport Beach and some of our history and our system. And, and one of the things, uh, you may notice right away from Newport is our harbor and our bay. And in some of the other slides, you also notice the, the phrase Mesa. Um, so the, the whole surrounding area of Newport is either right next to the ocean, right next to the harbor, or surrounded by a Mesa. And that plays into the, the historical decisions of where to get water for the city. Next slide. And uh, just for perspective, you know, we're about a 60, 60 to 65,000 person water system. Uh, next slide. And, uh, you know, one of the common industry, I guess, comparisons of system size is this kind of bottom left corner in terms of service connections. So we're about a 26,000 service connection system. So, uh, you know, even the state kind of uses that, that uh, terminology to kind of compare sizes of systems and so on. So we're definitely in that smaller to mid-size uh, system. Uh, next slide. Oh, just for fun, you know, water, um, we're in the firefighting business, you know, when you run a water utility and that includes fire hydrants and trying to protect those fire hydrants. Uh, next slide. And uh, here, here's that map that just kind of shows, again, um, you look at some of our, our very historic wells in the bottom right hand corner of the screen were much closer to the ocean. These were in the teens and 20s. And then um, in the late 30s, uh, we built a series of wells that were much further up, a good mile and a half further up over at Brookhurst and Adams. And we ran those wells all the way up until 1968, 1969. And you can see the green dotted lines. Uh, and that's where the injection barriers are. So even back then, you can see how the, um, the salinity was chasing us as we were trying to get further and further away. And in um, 
After 1968, 1969, when those wells salted up at Brookhurst and Adams, uh, the city went to 100% metropolitan water. And we were on metropolitan water um, up until the late 90s. Next slide. So here's a picture of one of our smiling operators. And so now we do run four uh, groundwater wells um, that we installed and implemented. It took years to get back uh, into the well business. Uh, as you know, trying to find the location and the connection point, how to get water from your groundwater source to uh, to your actual customers and city boundary took, took some time. But in the late 90s, we were able to uh, procure and install four new groundwater wells, which are in the city of Fountain Valley. Next slide. And here you go, here's another uh, view of that. And you can kind of see the general area of where our former wells were. And then you can see the circle of where our current um, uh, groundwater wells are. You can see that we went as far as we could above the barrier, uh, but we're also probably some of the closest wells to the barrier. And maybe that provides a benefit uh, to us in terms of some of the water we're receiving. Uh, but we're quite a ways away now. We're a good mile north of the barrier, or approximately a mile. And uh, that's where we have our four wells. And then we pipe that water all the way down uh, into the Newport Beach system. And that provides uh, about 75% of our water supply, uh, somewhere in the 12 to 15,000 acre foot a year uh, measurement. Next slide. And a few pictures of our wells, and, um, which are located on, on uh, their private property or school properties out hidden in the back corners so they're not in the way of other, um, other buildings and facilities. And then some of our pipeline uh, runs down the Talbert channel along the side of the channel, as you can see in the bottom right uh, picture to get uh, its way from Fountain Valley to Newport Beach. Next slide. So here's what I wanted to talk here about this slide um, was the relationship between the district and um, all of the other groundwater producers. And so we're one of 19 agencies that produce water out of this groundwater basin. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great relationship. And it starts, um, started many years ago and it, and it continues to be fostered in many ways. And I think, I think all of you can think about how many different meetings you are involved in on a regular basis. And then you kind of question yourself, wow, how productive is this meeting? How helpful was it? We accomplish it, especially the reoccurring ones. And um, what I'm here to tell you is from a, from a groundwater pumper standpoint, our relationship with the district, and I think many of the other um, <clears throat> agencies will agree, is, is really a great relationship. And there's, there's one aspect of that and how we accomplish a lot of these things is through, we have what's called a monthly groundwater produ producers meeting. We sit, at, uh, sit in a big room at the table with the general manager and the assistant general manager of the district and different people from the district in terms of their expertise. And then each of us as a producer, we come and we sit at this table. It could be uh, myself as a director, I could send one of my operational staff, it could be uh, a financial expert, and we sit there once a month getting together, and we talk about what we're learning, what are the challenges, what are the successes, what are our different viewpoints, right? We debate and we, we share and we kind of uh, uh, arm wrestle uh, as to what's happening from our local level as we're pumping water. And from that, just it's a very cooperative relationship we have many cooperative agreements. Um, you know, when we have something that we're concerned with, the, the district will jump right in there to do some extra testing for us. And, and they're all over the basin management, but they really provide um, that relationship, that care and concern to us as the people that are extracting the water out. And I just can't emphasize that enough. And I'm trying to share that with you by kind of showing uh, you this slide. And, including shared pipelines and, um, and resources and expertise. And that's just kind of uh, uh, our Newport Beach perspective, a really kind of short and sweet. And um, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, thanks, Crystal. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and thank you to, to John and Justin as well. Um, 
we have about 13 minutes until 11 o'clock, but our speakers have graciously agreed to stay on a little past 11 should there be a lot of questions. And we already have quite a few um, submitted to the Q&A box. And we did have uh, several questions submitted ahead of time as well. Um, just as a reminder, if you guys would like to ask a question, you can click that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will um, address the pre the pre-submitted questions first, followed by the written Q&A, and then if we have any more time to go to the raised hand feature, but you can always email us at info at um, So first up, and I see that uh, all three of our speakers um, will be joining us for, for this portion. Um, so to, to go to some of our pre-submitted questions, um, this person would love to hear some of the issues um, we've dealt with injecting water versus pumping water. Want me to take it, John? Absolutely. That's, that's right in your wheelhouse, Justin. <laughs> okay, so these are all production wells. They are drilled <clears throat> just exactly like you'd build a production well if Mark needed a well to produce water. Um, or we just got finished drilling for 20 inch diameter wells on a new area. So, and all the wells are constructed identical. The only thing different is that our wells have a flow control valve so that we can automate and automation is the key. Similar to the way Mark operates his production well field, it's all fully automated. He can start and stop pumps, just like I can start and stop injection wells. So the wells are identical. It just depends on how they're being operated. I hope I answered that question clear enough. If, if I could add one thing, please, Justin. Go ahead, John. Um, and you're right, for all intent and purposes, they're identical, but there is one different ingredient that we use for injection wells, and that has to do with the cement that we use for the seals. Very because, clear. Because injection wells are pushing water in the ground, and if your seal, your well seal is leaky, it's gonna go vertical on you and flow will go right up to the surface. So we use a special cement that has a very low potential to shrink or fracture and eliminates that uh, concern we now have of pushing the injection water up to the surface, if that makes sense. Correct, John. All right, our next question, um, it's a multi-part question. Um, they're interested in some successes and failures with the F FCVs, valve models, as well as injection pressures, flow rates, et cetera. Also interested in what modeling was completed prior to the injection well network being installed and if it's been updated or verified. And some of the biggest lessons learned um, in regards to operations and groundwater impacts. Well, I can talk briefly about the FCVs. He's talking about flow control valves, and there's three on the market, and I have two of them, and, and, and they all work fine. Um, I, I have my favorite, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, if they would like to get in touch with me about all the, the three different flow control valves so that you can automate your injection wells, I'd be very glad to assist them in detail. And John, the modeling, that would be something the, the Royce group could do, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Modeling was done, uh, no, I don't know necessarily prior to, it may be numerical modeling, uh, but I don't know about computer modeling prior to the original construction, but uh, we could certainly uh, check with Tim Sovich who prepared the historical slides because he is our groundwater modeler and he would know the history on that so <laughs> we'd be happy to get back to you on that if you uh, you know if we can email you all right the next question um, is for mark are you still adding fluoride to the water and how much uh, well we do not add any fluoride to our groundwater it's uh, there is a little bit of naturally occurring fluoride uh, from the minerals but uh, we do not add any fluoride all right, thank you. Um, next question, what future plans are there for expanding the seawater intrusion barrier, for example, at the Sunset Gap? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the Sunset Gap is being studied heavily right now. Uh, and uh, the district um, 
has installed several monitoring wells and pl they plan to install several more in strategic locations to study the advancement of seawater in the Sunset Gap. And there's preliminary talk at this point about potential, you know, uh, potentially installing some uh, injection wells there in the future. Thank you, John. And um, our last pre-submitted question um, is asking regarding um, some of the uh, planning being undertaken to, to protect it in the future uh, with any potential sea level rise. And I would like to say we do have your information. Um, we're going to have our chief hydrogeologist, Roy Herndon, um, respond. We will pass on your question to him because he is best equipped to answer that question, but it is an excellent, um, excellent question. Thank you, Crystal. That he, would, he would be the master. All right, moving on to some of the uh, written Q&A. We, we do have quite a few questions here, so we will try our best to get to all of them. And as I mentioned, John, Justin, and Mark have graciously agreed to stay past, a little past 11, to answer as many questions as possible. But as a reminder, if we do not get to your question, please feel free to email us at info at ocwd.com. And if you submitted your question non-anonymously, we do have that information and can get back to you as well. So first up, our question um, from uh, John. We were um, CL samples equally representative of the brackish water. The design could vary and the X, Y, Z and locations could intercept the hydrogeology brackish water differently. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't follow that. Can you, can you repeat that again, please? <laughs> And I apologize because I'm not good at, at acronyms, so I, I, I will just say CL, but were CL samples equally representative of the brackish water? All right, John. Yeah, yeah, chloride samples were, were representative of the brackish water for sure. Uh, tested uh, either in an independent lab on some of those earlier samples or through an in-house lab uh, at OCWD. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Carol Moore. Um, she also asked about uh, sea level rise, so we will um, we can respond to you in an, in an email, um, Councilwoman. But she did have a follow up question: Is there a problem with demineralized water and stainless steel? <laughs> That's a good one. But everything that we inject our water into are all stainless steel casings, and uh, we actually have some really um, in-depth uh, metal coupons that we observe and we report on that we watch on a, on a separate test bench that, that we watch very carefully. But uh, yes, all the, all the well casings are probably, I would assume, all good for 100 years of operation. The barrier currently is, is plus 50 currently one through 23. Although they've been worked on, we babied them along and they're, they're, we're fortunate that um, we, we do a lot of maintenance to our well system. All right, our next question comes to us anonymously. Can you describe your rehab procedure? Does it include chemical rehab? If so, what type? Okay, well, yeah, Justin kind of covered that uh, uh, briefly in his presentation. Um, we did use chemical, the short answer is we're, we're uh, unclogging our injection wells just by reverse pumping now or the airlift pumping, reversing the flow. Why? Because it's just those solid particles that are lodging in between the grain to grain contact. In the past, Justin and I have battled uh, polysaccharide slime forming bacteria down there that will uh, impede the injection rates tremendously. And yeah, we've had to use chemicals to go after those. But now that we're in this ultra modern era of groundwater replenishment system, we no longer leave any nutrients for that biology to grow. So uh, we're able to get away with not using chemicals and just reversing the flow direction for about 30, 35 minutes, right, Justin, on okay. average? That's about all it takes. And it's similar to pumping. Um, we, we have some wells that we have submersible pumps in and one of them right there on the campus, we'll probably pump it for 10 minutes and then turn around and run it for another month before we 
God, you are air left, are, are pumping or airlifting. And we've developed airlifting to the next level. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I've answered that question. John has covered it nicely. We have done extensive um, different programs, uh, jetting and airlifting simultaneously, all types of different methodologies. But currently, it's just reversing the flow. All right, our next question comes from, to us from Eddie Teasdale. How often do you add new gravel? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> this is good. And I like I this one. one. And, and you really never know. Um, we watch them twice a year on the new modern wells. And um, we actually keep real close eye on the discharge when we're airlifting. But since we can't see, like it says, you never see our best work, we have to do a lot of vigilant observations during our airlifting or during our pumping. We see anything that looks the least bit peculiar. We always double check our gravel feed tubes. I think in the last 10 years, maybe since we put in the uh, 16 new wells, I've had to add one five gallon bucket to 32 Baker. Other than that, we still watch them. And then on the on the legacy side, the older wells, we have yes. one uh, that's actually right on our campus that will swallow every time we replenish that tube. It's two or three super sacks. It's super sacks. So we uh, and those are uh, that's tons worth of gravel, by the way. And uh, we chalk that one up to overactive gophers in that area. <laughs> They're tunneling like crazy, and the gravel follows those tunnels. <laughs> All right, our next question comes to us from Bill Lieber. At what point in the district's history did the district take over from the state on managing the barrier and basin? That's you, John. Well, I, 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 I didn't quite catch it. Can you repeat it, Crystal? Sure, at what point in the district's history did the district take over from the state on managing the barrier and basin? Okay, uh, very good question, Bill. Thank you. 1933 is when we took over from the state uh, managing the groundwater basin. And the barrier uh, was always uh, the property of the Orange County Water District. Um, you know, Justin mentioned those three pilot wells in 1967, and those were drilled at the recommendation of the state. Uh, the and the, um, the entire build out of the barrier was also recommended by the state in a report back when Ronald Reagan was the governor of California. Uh, so yeah, the, the district has always controlled the barrier and they were granted the, uh, the right to manage the groundwater basin from the state in 1933. All right, our next question. Um, do you have or did you have land subsidence problems in the injection well area? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, we were visited, Justin and I, maybe 15 years ago before GWS, by a seismologist uh, for the ge geologic survey. And he was looking at uh, satellite imaging that could detect changes in land surface elevation at the millimeter level. And he was studying, and he's studying this to try and predict earthquakes and movement along fault. And he's looking at the Orange County area, and he's seeing this breathing effect of the basin where it might go down a few millimeters in the central part of the basin during the summer when there's a lot of pumping, and it might rebound those few millimeters in the winter when there's not a lot of pumping. And he's watching these cycles play out uh, over years, and he's realizing there's one part of our basin that isn't moving at all. The land surface isn't even moving a half a millimeter. And he came down to Orange County to talk to us geologists about it and see if we could understand, if he, we could explain to him this phenomenon. And so we asked him, well, where are you seeing this? And boy, it lined right up with Ellis Avenue. So, <laughs> so the injection uh, actually uh, does, um, uh, does a good thing in that it uh, eliminates any kind of uh, land surface subsidence. Uh, but uh, by the same token, it's so deep 
that it's not pushing the land surface up either. There's no upwelling occurring either. Thank you, John. Our next question, what percent of injected water goes to the coast versus inland? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, that's probably best answered by our modeling team, but uh, the uh, rough numbers I've just heard discussed is roughly half, but I know it, nothing in nature is that uh, straightforward. And, and you have to realize you have some negative pressure on the pumping side of the barrier. So I would imagine more than half would flow inland, less, less would uh, flow oceanward. But we would have to get back to you after we check with the model to give you an actual number in terms of percent. Okay, and we do have um, his name, so we can definitely do that after the fact. Um, thank you, Eric, for your question. Um, our next question, have you been able to push back the intrusion toward the ocean or only hold it at its maximum intrusion location? Yeah, that's a great question. The answer lies in how many monitor wells we have. <laughs> we believe we're pushing it back based on the spacing of the monitor wells that are in the ground now. Uh, but groundwater moves very, very slowly. So if we can hold our protective elevation at, at that one area there where I showed you that Lambda uh, Talbert emergent zone, um, where we have the critical monitor well that we that Justin can look at his phone on, uh, that's that's really uh, you know that's kind of where we 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 put a lot of stock on that. Let's just say that. All right, our next question: um, How does the desalination process impact injection processes? There shouldn't be any connection there. So the desal water is going to come right out of the ocean. Um, and uh, uh, in its own pipeline, we're injecting uh, at great depth. There should be no connection there whatsoever. If, if uh, yeah, when or if or when the desalination comes to Orange County. All right, our next question. Um, you mentioned redevelopment back flushing approximately every 40,000 gallons. How frequent um, is this? Daily, weekly, how long of the duration, et cetera? Okay, yeah, so I'll let Justin speak to that, but it's 30 million, not 30,000. I just want to make that correction. Actually, actually, that, that John's got that correct. If, if a well is doing 695 gallons a minute, that's about 1 million gallons per day. And we don't like to let them go too long. So I've seen Scott and Randy and, and Wes get back after these wells after 40 to 42. I'm experimenting with the new mid basin wells. I was looking at those yesterday. We're gonna backwash those on Thursday. But they're currently injected 85 million gallons. So Depending upon everything in the system, whether it's distribution or the well itself, we're, we're, we're always experimenting, always open for new ideas with the team. And we work really closely together. Um, every injection well is as different as your children. You have to treat them as such. They don't all work the same. That's why coined this, you never see our best work. So there's a lot to look at when you're operating any injection well. Um, there was a question that I saw last night that came in and, and we rate these wells on injection water level rise um, similar to pumping. So when you look at a pumping well, what we call the yield, it's the amount of gallons per minute divided into the drawdown and we get a yield, we turn that upside down and we look at the updraw divided by gallons per minute. And uh, that's how we look at things in calling an injection well. So hopefully I've, I've made that semi clear. Thank you, Justin. Our next question, I apologize if I mispronounce this word. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, why do you prefer wire wrap of Louvre for injection wells? 
Well, I'll let John touch this one. So oh, I'm cool. in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Talk about passing the buck. Okay. <laughs> Just when you think you know somebody. Yeah. Um, so that quick and dirty answer there is we, we, they're both fine products. Like, you know, the, uh, the wire wrap versus the louver. Obviously, the louver is going to be a, a stronger product, uh, but our wells are a little shallower and we're trying to push water out. So we favor the uh, open space and the wire wrap has uh, more open space than the traditional louvers and other wellspring products. This discussion will go on for decades. <laughs> this is like, uh, do you want it, Do you prefer Ford or do you prefer Chevy? There it's you go. Thank you, John. Yeah. <laughs> I like the open area. All right. Our, um, currently, our last question um, submitted, unless we, we get any additional, um, is do you ever uh, get any clogging of either the injection or production wells? Is operation and maintenance any different between the two types of wells? Justin, you want to take that? Sure. Now, Mark's wells, we like to pull our production wells about every 10 years. Pull the pump out. The, the pump out of the, out of the well casing. Um, they're very mechanical. Uh, you've got a line shaft, uh, water lubricated bearings. You've got a pump that's buried. You can't see it. Um, you're always listening. You're watching your flow rates. You never know what you're going to find. So on a production well, generally, and I, I, may, I may be incorrect, but I think about every 10 years they need to be inspected. Injection wells, um, no, I'm sorry. Let's go back to the production well. And then we'll bring in a pump rig after we've got the pump out, and we'll do a swab, bale, airlift. They also may want to do some uh, rehab work, and there's many different... Um, techniques used. Some of the uh, contractors like to use chemicals in their rehab that are very, very safe for the environment. Um, but as far as the injection wells go, we just like to reverse their flow from time to time. And, uh, and we watch all of our wells very, very closely on our yield, our updraw. Same thing that Mark would look at with his, uh, his yield on gallons per lineal foot of drawdown. So we all have our similar methods to, uh, to maintain the wells. Would you agree, Mark? Yes, I agree. Uh, we, we tend to um, pull our wells every five years for five? inspection. We have. Um, all right. Well, I wanted to thank you all so much. That is all the time we have for today. Thank you to John Von Sangu, Justin McKeever, and Mark Vukovic for joining us, for sharing their expertise with the audience. Um, and thank you all so much for joining with us and uh, joining us and staying with us a little bit after 11 o'clock. I hope you found this webinar informative. Um, tomorrow, you will all receive a link to the recording. So if you'd like to, to watch it or pass it on to any colleagues, we would definitely appreciate that. Um, thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.